Thank you everyone for joining us today in our International Women in Math Day Careers panel. So before we start, um, I, on behalf of BAMS, would like to acknowledge that this call is taking place across the traditional lands of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including the Wurundjeri and Bururan people of the Kulin Nation. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to their other Indigenous people who are currently present, and I would like to acknowledge and respect the contribution they have made to the life of this region, especially within the mathematics community. So hello everyone, my name is Wendy and I am the president of MOMS. And today we have four amazing panelists to share with you their experiences in math and stats, in their um, learning journey, in their career, research, etc. So um, let's start off with a short introduction for the panelists. Um, it, please unmute yourself and kind of introduce yourself a little bit to our audience. Um, I might just start uh, with Susanna, if that's all right. No worries. So I'm Susanna. I am a senior research fellow and statistician at Queensland University of Technology, and I love stats. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go off my list here. Let's hear it from Ifan. Hi everyone, um, my name is Yifan. Uh, I am a final year student studying a major in mathematics and a concurrent diploma in computing. Um, I may not have as much experience as the rest of the panelists here, but hopefully I can offer um, insights from a student's perspective. Um, thanks everyone. Thanks Yifan. And uh, Madeline, can you introduce yourself as well? Uh, thanks, Wendy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Madeline. It is lovely to see some familiar faces and names um, on the screen. Um, I am currently an associate at a company called Strategy And, and hopefully we'll get to explaining what that is, because I certainly wouldn't have known when I was in your position as a student. Um, and I finished a master's in pure maths in 2020 in Lorentzian geometry. Um, and I am excited to talk about women in maths with you guys. Thanks so much. And finally, we have Marcy. Well, hi, everybody. Um, so I am uh, Marcy Robertson. I'm a senior lecturer and a future fellow in pure mathematics at the University of Melbourne. And it's really good to see both Madeline and Yifan again. And nice to meet you, Susanna. Um, I think we haven't met before, right? I'm dead. No, okay. So. In Good. I'm really bad with names, so I was like hoping that I had scored that one. Um, so yeah, I study topology. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from Australia originally. I'm from the US, um, and I've worked in Canada, France, America, and Australia. So I'm happy to also talk about um, those things. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone, all of your questions, and hopefully we'll answer them somewhat poorly. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. So um, since we're all fellow math enthusiasts in this room today, our first question is, how did you get interested in maths or your current study or research area? So anyone can jump in to answer this question, or we can go around in the same order that we did our introductions, if that's all right. <laughs> sure, going the same order I guess for now. Um, so for me, when I first was exposed to statistics, it was in high school. We had a very tiny bit of statistics component there. I loved the maths. I found the statistics really quite peculiar and odd and could not figure out why anyone would want to do that. And then I had um, my undergrad degree is actually a Bachelor of Medical Science. And we had one subject that was statistics at maths and stats for medical science. And it kind of confirmed for me that statistics was very strange and very dull and fairly hard to understand. And so then I did a master's degree and I had to do a biostatistics subject and I was so dreading it. But in that subject, I found statistics could be really powerful. It could be incredibly useful and it could really unlock the information in data. And so then I decided it was amazing and awesome. I didn't do things by halves. Um, and so then I started to happily got some junior roles at University of Queensland, love statistics still in the research environment, did some um, a grad cert in statistics, worked at Cancer Council Queensland, ended up um, doing a PhD in statistics. Um, and it has been an excellent career choice. Thanks. That sounds super interesting. Okay, let's hear from Yifan. Um, 
for me, um, I started off um, by doing quite a generic first year. So I tried a bit of mathematics, of course, but also lots of other sciences like chemistry and physics. Um, what changed my mind was um, throughout first year, um, I realized I'm always looking forward to the math lectures the most. Um, and then towards the end of first, I realized, oh, if I enjoy the lecture so much, maybe I should just major in it. Um, so that's how I picked my major. Um, yeah, and I've been really enjoying it so far and hopefully will continue to do so. Just a short follow-up question for Ifa. I know you're also doing a diploma in computing. How did you get interested in that? Oh, yeah. Um, what motivated me to start a diploma in computing was um, there was someone back in high school, so sort of a teacher of mine, who I really look up to. And then at a similar event, at a similar panel, um, someone was asking, oh, what was something you wish you have done differently if we undergraduate? And she said, oh, I wish I have done more computing. She uses computing so much in her current job, uh, as, well, um, as well as mathematics. Um, but hearing that from her and from multiple other people kind of made me realize, oh, computing is very powerful in the current world and it pairs very well with mathematics. Um, so yes, yeah, so I decided to do a concurrent diploma as well. Great, that's awesome. And Madeline, would you like to share how you got interested in maths and stats? Yeah, sure. Um, so I remember I always really liked maths in high school, but I think it really clicked for me when I came to uni um, and I was sitting in the first year accelerated maths course with Paul Norbury, the name drop, and we did linear algebra. And I remember it just like blew my mind sort of like quite basic first year linear algebra but the idea of doing proofs or we did stuff like proving that the square root of two was an irrational number um and I think what appealed to about it to me was the sort of the completeness and rigor like I was doing all my other first year science subjects like physics and chemistry and I always felt there was like a missing explanation or we were just looking at a, an assumption or a theory and like not the full picture and what really appealed to me about pure math specifically was we are looking at a full picture we're dealing with absolute truths which maybe says a lot about like my relationship to the world um, but it was really nice to sort of do something that was both felt really absolute and had a lot of clarity to it um, and I also just really enjoyed how challenging I found it like I definitely struggled at a lot of points throughout my degree but I really sort of enjoyed how hard and difficult and how sometimes an insurmountable challenge a pure maths assignment felt like. Um, and a little bit more as well about like how my relationship to maths has changed leaving um, academia and sort of study is that I really enjoy in my job now how I get to use what, what we do in our in um, sort of strategy consulting is not so much detailed analysis. There are a lot of really smart data scientists who can deal with huge quantities of data, but trying to look at numbers and get to very like broad estimates or approximate sizes of an issue really quickly to help decision making. So, you know, I normally work for government agencies. If a government agency wants to decide really quickly if they should look into running a program or something like that. Um, or doing implementing a big policy reform, being able to like look at data, consolidate data, and then but like in a very short turn of time, turn it into like, is this feasible? Do we think that it's going to make sense for how much it'll cost versus how much we think it'll improve society or have an impact? So I have also really been enjoying that sort of different side of maths as well. Yeah, the, it's very interesting how you talk about you studying pure maths, but also finding applications for it. We'll definitely kind of circle back to that idea in, in mm. the future. But um, can we hear from Marcy? How did you get into maths and stats? Um, so I am a mathematician because I'm a failed painter, as it turns out. So um, I've always liked science and thought it was true. And then, but I went to art school, actually, like to study fine arts. Um, and after about a year of that, I realized that I, I was missing, you know, that thing. It was not going to be Picasso. Um, and my dad reminded me that we were not rich, so I should probably, like, find a profession. So I switched my major to physics. Uh, my undergrad degree is in astrophysics. Um, 
And but math, sort of in the in the process of studying physics, the more theoretical topics always appealed. And I, I got really interested in math for actually something very similar to what Madeline just said. Um, there is sort of a when you solve something as a mathematician, you find like a, a sort of core truth or like it's the same thing that drew, drew me to art in many ways. It's like it's a it's a, a value that translates um, across any language, across any barrier, right? We all know when we see a good painting and in some sense, math is the same thing. We all know when we see a good proof. You know it when you see it, like it's this beautiful thing. Um, so then my graduate, I, I switched to do a PhD in math from there, um, in pure math. And that was a, that was a rough uh, transition, not gonna lie. <laughs> um, but uh, I, uh, yeah, I found it to be really appealing. Um, I, I also wasn't good at it, sort of naturally. Like if you'd ask any of my teachers in the past, undergraduate or even high school, was I gonna be a mathematician? They'd be like, uh, probably not. I mean, she was a fine student, you know? Like I, I was a decent student, but not somebody that stood out. But like not being good at it kind of made me really angry. And um, like the challenge of it has, has continued, I mean, that continues to be the draw of being a mathematician. Like you can always find a problem that will just utterly crush you. And um, I, um, that's the reason I show up in the morning, um, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, so so my journey to math was a weird one. Somehow I've, I'm looking for things that were like, I don't know, inherently beautiful in nature. And there's nothing more beautiful than math. Or statistics, I'm gonna throw that out there too. Um, uh, but no, I mean, you know, it's the underlying like features of the world that we're studying. And um, you can be really romantic about it, but that's that's how it feels. That's very beautifully put, actually. Yeah, thank you, Marcy. So, following up from from kind of your initial interest, how did you end up um, kind of landing in your current career or research? And for Ethan, I kind of wonder, um, even if you're a student, you have worked and taught at um, the Australian Masters of Olympia training program, things like that. So, how did you transition? from being in university into doing kind of other stuff related to math, your research jobs, et cetera. So anyone can jump in or we can go in the same order, whichever you guys prefer. I'm conscious that if I talk first, <laughs> I feel like we're going in the same order. Um, so I think I, I always wanted to help people. And I think that was why I originally did medical science. I was thinking I'd become a doctor, a medical doctor. But once I discovered how amazing statistics was, and you can actually use statistics to help many more people than you'd actually see in a you know one-on-one -on -one consultation uh, with a lot less stress and a lot less risk of killing them as well, which is all a bonus. So I really um, was fortunate to be working at Cancer Council Queensland at the time. So we had a lot of cancer data sets to analyze and my PhD was actually looking at inequities in looking at small area rates of cancer incidence and cancer survival across the state of Queensland. And that project, um, you know, finished it throughout my PhD. Um, we got a lot of uh, media attention, a lot of um, uh, policy changes actually in result like additional funding for patients who lived in rural areas, which was incredibly rewarding and exciting. Um, and then I continued working at Cancer Council Queensland for his PhD, and we actually got funding to like a national uh, project, which became the Australian Cancer Alps, which we released in 2018. Um, and then a couple of years after that, I moved to Queensland University of Technology. I'm still working closely with Cancer Council Queensland. We're about to, um, well, currently working on questions they're about to. Next year, sometime, we'll be releasing the next phase of the Australian Cancer Alps, which will have spatiotemporal changes and um, risk factors and other exciting things, some treatment information lots of really interesting small area patterns. Um, but I'm continuing to expand into other areas as well. So but I still have this real kind of focus around uh, that geographic health inequities is probably my absolute passion. So I feel very fortunate kind of just somehow fortuitously landed in that space. Yeah, that's very that that is like a very kind of natural career career transition from my point of view hearing about what you talk. Um, but have you ever kind of sorry let me rephrase that 
Um, were you always able to see where you're going to go in your career or were there any surprises or unexpected turns in the way? I never had any idea what I was doing in my career. <laughs> Um, in fact, when I started at QUT, I was on a, it was called a strategic um, research fellowship. And I just, I loved, I was like a strategic research fellow, um, which, you know, I felt so unstrategic in every area of my career. So I got a business card printed quickly with that title on it. So I still have those cards. <laughs> that is very, yeah. I, now I also wonder for your particular career, um, how much do you think your maths and stats background plays into it? And is it a very typical career in your opinion for maths and stats students to follow into or any advice in their area if they do want to transition? Yeah, so I think a lot of people I know in statistics, they've done different degrees, sometimes, you know, ecology or uh, astronomy or various things, but then they kind of realize they can use statistics to really drill down and figure out what's really happening in that field. So um, I don't know if there is a typical statistics career path. I think if you come from a you know, different background but apply that knowledge into a statistics, you have such an advantage. But if you come from a maths background and stats background and apply that, like, you know, then learn more about this particular field, you also have a huge advantage in that you really understand those models and you're totally immersed in them and you are um, sometimes um, maybe more confident in applying them than someone who's come the other way. So whichever way you go, I think you can have an incredibly impactful career. Yeah, thank you, Susanna. I think we'll move on to Ifan. And I guess the question for you then is, how are you finding um, kind of the transition between your university work to the work that you do outside? Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Yeah, so outside of uni, um, I volunteer weekly at this place called the Institute for Inquiry Minds. Um, so basically every week um, we offer free math tutoring for a high school student from this advantage background. Um, I think one reason why I feel very passionate about math mentoring um, is that I didn't realize, well, in high school, I did feel like, oh, math is interesting but I didn't realize how beautiful it could be until I got to uni and got introduced to, as Madeline said, like linear algebra or group theory in second year. Um, and I think for students in high school, when they need to face those repetitive exercise every day, it's really hard to, for the, for, it's really difficult for them to see too far ahead. Like, oh, well, I can apply this math in, or, oh, there's so much, research uh, new maths um, happening every single day. So I think what I learned from university, um, I can use those to um, offer the high school students a slight insight into what maths truly is in at university. Um, so a way for them to step out outside the high school classroom for a second and have a look at all oh, this um, that is this beautiful abstract world. Um, yeah, so that's um, one reason why I feel very passionate about um, mass mentoring. Um, and if anyone um, here, they're interested, um, well, Institute for Inquiry Minds are always looking for volunteers. Um, so if you're interested, I strongly encourage you to try it out. Yeah, thank you. And uh, also, I do want to ask about your vacation research scholar project last summer. Um, I know that you've kind of done some teaching in those areas, but how about research? How are you finding that connection to your university work? Oh, it's similar, but also different. So um, when doing a uni subject, you have exercises and you know those questions have a certain answer. So you can either prove it or not prove it. Um, but when doing the research over the summer, uh, it's, well, no one knows the answer to it. So we're really exploring the unknown. Um, even though my supervisor, um, they probably have some sort of idea of where we're going. Um, but really, you are in control of your own problem. Um, if you want to change this direction slightly, you can just change it and then explore the part that you're curious about. Um, so I found that flexibility as well as that um, need to take initiative your, and be more active in choosing what you want to study. I found that to be really interesting. Okay. 
Thank you, Ifan. I think we'll move on to Madeline then. Um, can you please talk a little bit about your transition from university work to your job right now as an associate? Um, I know that you, um, you are one of the few people, the, one, the only person who is kind of in industry with your career. So can you please elaborate on that? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so the way that I found consulting was entirely by accident and also procrastination. Um, I was procrastinating. I think I had an assignment due for I sort of midway through my master's program. I had an assignment due one evening. There was some event that like I'd been invited to or seen on Facebook that was a careers event that women in science and engineering were running about women in STEM going into consulting, very specific. Um, and it sort of got to like five o'clock. I was like, I'm not going to get any more maths done today. I might as well go to this event and just see what's happening. And, and I went along. And one of the things that I sort of, I reflect on now, yeah, procrastination does always open up. That's the takeaway from um, my experiences, um, is one of the things I really enjoyed at uni was my work of getting involved with mums um, and being part of mums and getting to do things like you know, think about how to make mums run as a better society and, you know, address problems that I saw facing the maths world, like the lack of women in maths and doing things like helping mums set up the gender quota on the committee so we could ensure that we always had good representation. And I also, at that time, was secretary of the Graduate Student Association. And what I loved there was getting to, like, run these big programs or help change the organization so that could better do what I thought was something really important like helping graduate students and and providing them a voice to speak directly with university administration and I went to consulting and all of a sudden like a lot of what they said just sounded really cool so what consultants do is they uh, particularly management consulting is they go to organizations and they provide them advice around things like how can they be a better organization how can they run better how can they um, you know, better do whatever work they do. And I'm lucky to mostly consult for government clients. Um, so that's helping government organisations or, you know, or places like universities do what they do better. Um, so I went along to this event and there was a bunch of people there. They were talking and stuff also that really appealed to me was that you work on a variety of projects. You do three, four months on one project, then you switch. You work with a whole new team for a different client you become a mini expert in whatever industry you're working in with it, whatever person you're working with. Um, so that all just sounded like super appealing. And I had a chat. The other thing I'd recommend from careers event is I just had a chat to the panelists afterwards to like hear more from them and introduce myself. Um, and one of the people who um, was at the event was someone who works for strategy and who I now work really closely with. And she eventually contacted me like three months after the event being like, hey, we've got something called the Diversity and Inclusion Scholarship um, and you should apply for it. So um, Strategy Ant has this really cool diversity and inclusion internship program where you can come along um, if you're passionate about like different issues in diversity and inclusion. Um, and I was lucky enough to get that scholarship and I did an internship with them in December 2020. And after that was lucky enough to get a job. Um, and I think the other thing as well, just like my reflections from that, is it's really great to come along to careers events and sort of understand different things. Because when I was at uni, I certainly had very little idea about what different career options looked like as a mathematician. Um, and there are a lot of different things. Consulting's great for some people and not for others. Um, and it's really good to just learn about what those options are. Um, and I know as well, a lot of my friends who I studied with in the master's programs have ended up in consulting. So it's a place that really values people who are like very like analytical and logical thinkers, which is a skill that we all have in spades as mathematicians. Great. Thank you, Madeline. And let's finally move on to Marcy, who have who has had a very expensive career. So uh, feel free to just let us know what you've been doing and your journey through math and stats. Yeah, so I, I just want to first say, like, as um, this is, as I told people, this is my third Women in Maths event of the day. And Madeline is my third um, alumni from Uni Melb who have different career stages, who have all mentioned getting their jobs by going to careers events networking with people and like having this really good experience of like meeting um, people that they clicked with. So 
I would just like say, apparently that's a thing and we should do it. Um, I mean, like it's, I've heard it multiple times today and I find that really inspiring. Um, and um, right, so my career, so like I said, I, I didn't know I was going to be an academic. I didn't really know I was going to be a researcher. Um, I started in grad school kind of thinking maybe I'd be like a, um, we have a thing in the US called community college, which is like, like fancy high school, basically. I mean, it's like, it's, um, it's free usually. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go teach community college. It pays a little bit better than being a high school math teacher. Um, I like science. This is what I'm going to be in. And it, there was a moment in my first semester of grad school when I was really struggling with a problem set. And I didn't realize I was actually good at math until this like exact moment. Um, like I was really ashamed of myself turning in three of six problems for an assignment. And I was the only one in the entire class who finished any of the problems. <laughs> And I didn't realize that that happened. Like um, I was so embarrassed and I apologized to the professor and the professor happened to be a woman. And she was just like, you know, I never expected you to solve any of these, right? Um, and at that very moment, I was like, maybe I should do this. Um, like, you know, like, I, I don't know, it built my confidence in a way that I didn't know existed. And um, as far as an academic career, it's, it's absolutely brutal. And anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. Um, but there was at this moment, once I made the decision that I was not going to be anything else, I was going to do research and I was going to be good at it. That second part remains to be seen, <laughs> but, um, like, cause you never feel satisfied. I actually literally earlier today turned in my promotion for the next level in, in the academic hierarchy. And I wrote the teaching part in like half an hour. We, we, we write the some 30 page document about your life. Like you turn it as part of this application. Teaching part was like, fine. Um, I wrote the leadership part, whatever. And then I sat there and stared at the research part for the last month and a half, like just full of anxiety. Like I thought I'd be better by now, you know? Um, so like that never goes away, but um, then you never feel good enough. And that actually is why I keep coming back somehow. Um, like, I, I like it very much. And um, I mean, I heard a version of that in every statement of the other people as well. They said it in nicer and more polite ways, but like, um, like being challenged and, and solving problems and communicating about those problems um, is so fulfilling that there was no other option. And so once I made the decision, then I did, I did very um, lady in math things. I studied. I learned what the definition of a professor was. <laughs> I studied other people's CVs. I, I actually read a book on how to be an academic, probably more than one, you know, like I, I studied the job and I figured out how I was going to make that work for me. And I've done those things, you know, I tick my boxes. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically the career. Like, but, but you have to make the decision. And it's, it's a hard decision to make. I don't have Susanna's experience of sort of not really knowing. Um, but I do know with research that is the case. Like somehow you never really know what you're going to research. You just sort of fall into that um, based on how much you enjoy something on that given day um, or something like that, right? Like, and um, another thing that also came up with all the people on the panel before me was about how important it is to communicate. Um, and that's something that we as women bring because we're so used to undercutting ourselves and trying to make ourselves be accessible. We're also like phenomenal communicators and um, <laughs> it makes us very good sort of at transitioning to industry or communicating with scientists. Um, or sort of being able to soften math in a way that's non-threatening as a teacher. And I, I do think that's something, I mean, while it's, it's still a, a rough place as a woman in math, I do think you should also think about the strengths that we bring. Um, I wanna be positive today. This is my third event. My first event, I was more negative. And by the third one, I was like, I don't know. I'm actually pretty happy to be a woman in math. Like we bring something new. Um, and, 
anyway, it came up and everyone's talked for me. And so I wanted to say, yeah, we, we bring this ability to communicate, to actually talk to people. Um, Cause we're used to understating ourselves <laughs> in a nice way. <laughs> I think Masi brings up a very good point that I really kind of want to touch on today. So I can hear that all of you guys are very, very passionate about what you do, very passionate about pursuing your master's as career. But I wonder, have you encountered any challenges in your field because of your gender? Have you encountered any stereotypes or any kind of doubts in yourself? I think we can start with- Yes. Oh, yes, Masi, yes. Yeah. And yeah, I guess <laughs> have you is kind of a very, very easy question to answer. I think everyone have encountered some difficulty, but how do you find yourself dealing with it and how do you overcome these challenges? I guess it's the better question to ask. So we can start with Susanna again, if you like. Uh, I actually, I don't think I've really experienced any kind of um, negative consequences from being a woman in statistics. So. Uh, there's been times I've been in like a project meeting or on a committee. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm the only woman here. But I've always found um, most of the guys I know in statistics are just so aware of gender issues and so wanting to see things change. Um, they really champion uh, me quite often, which um, is lovely. And, you know, I've been involved in the Statistical Society of Australia, um, plenty of statistics conferences, you know, there might be a preponderance of men in many of the sessions um, in the audience. But um, again, I've, I've actually never met an unpleasant statistician. I may have had a very um, charmed life, obviously. Oh, I expect this well Statistically, there's probably an, a horrible statistician somewhere in the world, um, but I haven't met any in Australia. That is really, really great to hear. Um, does anyone else want to share? Uh, any encounters with gender issues or? Uh, I think following up from Susanna, uh, my experience at uni so far is very similar. I think we're very lucky at uni, again, um, both black jurors and students, they're aware of the gender equality issue in mathematics and other STEM fields. Um, so even though very often I'm the only girl in, in my math or computing tutorial, it's still the case of the semester. Um, but I think no one ever um, picked me, pick, like, yeah, pointed out, because people are still people, and nice people are always just nice people. Um, so it still makes me feel very um, welcome and included. Uh, another thing is I found it really nice or inspiring to kind of have some role model to look up to. Um, so... There, were, there are amazing female lecturers at our school. Um, and yeah, just looking at what they do uh, makes me feel, um, just believe me myself more, like, oh, they can do it. Um, they're working so hard towards it. So I'll just do the same. And maybe one day I can follow their footstep. Um, so I think paying attention to role models around you and see what they're doing um, can be very encouraging. That's a very great point. And I'm sure all, our, all of our panelists today make amazing role models. So that's perfect. And I think I'll move on to Madeline because I actually encountered an article that you wrote in 2019 where you interviewed math students about their experience in the field. Um, yeah, I would just like love to hear your perspective on that one. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. I am very flattered that that article is still in the public consciousness and you managed to stumble across it. Um, because that it, that was writing that article was a really important moment for me because um, I did my undergrad at Melbourne Uni I majored in pure maths and at the end it was absolutely not my plan to come back and do a master's um, and it was through writing that article that I better understood my motivations why I think for me being a woman in maths has not been so much about external sort of criticism or barriers but more how I've internalized what the landscape is like and how that how I've made decisions or felt about things um, so when I was finishing up my undergrad I actually I did a diploma in Chinese and I actually wanted to go do my master's in China 
and study international relations because I thought that would be cool and it sounded fun. Um, and I didn't really want to do a master's. And I think at the time I was just like, oh, it just doesn't seem like fun. Like I won't make friends. Like it just doesn't seem like a vibe. Like I, I wasn't making decisions on very like, you know, on lots of information. Let's put it that way. Um, and when I, and then I only applied for like a couple of programs and I didn't get into either of them. And then I was like, well, it would be really easy to just go and do the masters. Like you just have to like tick a box if you've done the undergrad. Um, so I may as well do that. And I came back and I applied for it and I, and so I came back to do the masters and writing that article when I first started, um, I remember going along to my first lecture, um, and just feeling so out of place. There was like one other woman in the lecture theater there were maybe 50 people there um and I just remember thinking like what is going on like where are all the women why is it it feels like the 1950s that this is our level of gender representation and so I interviewed a bunch of undergrad students um, about their experiences and why they were or weren't thinking about studying maths and what came out of that was all these people were saying like, yeah, maths is cool. Like people aren't actively being like, you're a woman, you can't do maths, but I just don't feel like I fit in. Like I just don't. And I think that that's like internalized um, sort of sexism. You just, your, your stereotype or image of a mathematician is a man. And it's quite easy to think, well, that's not me. That's not the sort of person I am. Therefore I don't fit in. This isn't my community. And it was by going and doing the masters, like I made many friends, I loved working. I you know, didn't really have any major instances during my studies of people saying you can't do maths, you're a woman. Um, but I nonetheless like had internalized a lot of things and that affected how I made the decision um, initially, at least to not pursue a masters. And, you know, and to be really candid as well, like that absolutely affected my experience of being a master's student in a classroom full of guys. I often felt like, well, I can't be seen to be incompetent or like not know what I'm talking about or be honest about the fact I absolutely haven't done the preparation for this lecture because I feel like, you know, somehow I'm representing women. Like I don't want to look like I'm bad at maths because I'm the only woman here and that's going to, I feel like that might make a statement. Um, which was an absolute barrier. I remember Marcy's often said, like, you've got to ask dumb questions. That's how you become a good mathematician. Um, and that was a, like, hard lesson for me to learn is, like, how do you, what what makes you a good mathematician is your willingness to, like, admit you don't know something, to ask lots and lots of questions, especially if they, even if you think they're, like, obvious ones. Um, but, yeah, writing that article was a great point for me. It made me realise a lot of things, and I think... It took me until the end of my master's degree, I think, to feel more confident in, in my own mathematical ability. And I think a lot of that is about gender and how I had internalized things. Yeah, thank you, Madeline. So we have a question in the chat. What's the title of the article? Uh, I might just pop it in the chat right here. I pasted it. It's called Mad About Inequality, Gender Representation in Mathematics Student Interviews. Um, I'm sure you can find it on the AMSO website if I'm not mistaken, but just Google it, it will come up. Thank you, Madeline, for answering that question. And yeah, I really like the article. Um, so we'll move on to Marcy. And I think Marcy might have a lot to say about kind of the representation of women in math because you did describe the academic kind of field as brutal. I'm not sure if that's to do with gender or just the fact that it's academia, but we'll hear from Marcy. <laughs> It's a solid combination of both. Um, so I, I will say that just in general, like um, statistically, since we got statisticians in the room, you're as likely to be drafted to the NBA, um, so the Professional Basketball League in the, in, um, the US, without ever having played high school basketball as you are to get a PhD in mathematics and then get a research one, which is the type of job that University of Melbourne is or a top research university in the US position, which is to say it's very rare. <laughs> so it, it's brutal in the sense of selection period. But what Madeline was speaking to is something that's very real, um, especially in pure mathematics and also theoretical physics, when you go to like the quote unquote hard sciences, which by the way, is not like a real distinction. It's like a societal one. Um, there's a, a judgment of what is good 
Like there's, there's a way that we sort of decide who belongs in the room. There's like a fascination with the young genius, with the sort of independent thing. I mean, like just look at TV and what TV depicts as mathematicians and physicists. And um, I just read an article in the New Yorker today about Growth and Deke, who by the way is a mathematical idol of mine, but like, do we really need another article on this? It's this idea of like what, what genius is um, and that like math is done by lone genius. And this is not true. Um, and you'll notice it in, in a variety of ways. Like when I was a grad student, I picked up on probably many of the same things that Madeline felt. Like the, the student who asks questions in seminar is the good one. Um, the, the student who like always speaks up in class, the person who's like quick with answers, like really quick response to questions, they know more stuff. And it took me a long time. Actually, there was this experience. I was a postdoc in Canada and there was this um, absolutely fantastic, great guy who I was friends with, who was also a postdoc. And what would happen is we had this seminar and I would ask a question. And inevitably we had a rotating cast of speakers. So every week was a different speaker from a different university all around the world would come. It was a really active group in my area of topology. I would ask a question inevitably, no matter what I ask, man, woman, child, whoever was speaking would say, oh yeah, yeah, no problem. And my friend who was sitting next to me would then raise his hand and he was like, I, for, and I don't think he would be offended by this. He was like a tall, good looking, confident white guy. I mean, he was like the stereotype of like, high school football captain or something in America. Like, he would ask literally the exact same question and would inevitably get like a hugely different answer. And I didn't realize, I was actually kind of pissed. And, <laughs> sorry. and after about three weeks, I was like, what the hell? Like I, after a seminar, I was like, what is, what is your problem? And he was like, I'm trying to teach you something. He was like, you ask a perfectly fine question and they didn't answer you. And like, you didn't follow up. Like they've completely dismissed your question. And I actually wanted to know the answer. So I asked the same question. And he was like, you need to stand up for yourself. And I didn't realize that, that there was a moment like that, like somehow the way in which I asked questions or the fact that I just seemed not worthy of answering was like actually like affecting the way that other people in the room saw me. And what was a liberating ex experience is I started, after that, I started to pay like a huge amount of attention to the smart guys in the room. And they asked the dumbest questions. Like, honestly, they asked things that I already know the answer to that was clearly an obvious, like a missed minus sign is completely not worth having this discussion. Like they completely derailed the whole seminar just because they didn't, like they missed a notation like 20 minutes ago. And yet they were the smart guys and I was the one who wasn't worth answering. And so I just started asking dumb questions. And then it turns out that that, that makes you good. Um, it turns out that that's, that's the rule. And so anytime you're even remotely confused, just ask the question because that's what the super confident people are doing in the room. They don't think it's stupid. They're getting their questions answered and everybody thinks better of them at the same time. And uh, so, yeah, as far as negative effects, imagine that times 3000, right? Like when I first came to Australia, um, I got grant reviews like, this is not the kind of math we do in Australia or she could really benefit from a mentor. Um, really like, absolutely disparaging um, sexist stuff. And then eventually you just learn how to, you just keep going. You just keep going and going and going until they can't say no anymore <laughs> and then you're fine. Um, and so that's what I mean by brutal. Like, is, is, the, is it sexism? Is it you? You're not really sure, like you can't be certain. Like, am I failing to be the appropriate kind of confident or is it the fact that I'm a girl? Like, and you're, you're never gonna figure it out. 
um, you just keep going. And uh, so I try very hard now in my position to tell my students to just ask dumb questions. <laughs> Because all the, all the guys are asking dumb questions, and that seems to work better for them. So that's the best I got um, is to keep going. So yeah, Thank that you. was not as positive as I meant it, but like it, it is actually getting better. <laughs> no, I think from what Masi said that I, it does take a lot of tenacity to kind of keep going as a woman in a mass career. And I think everyone will benefit from that advice of kind of just be confident and ask some questions because I think that's what learning is about anyways in maths and in general. Because they're not actually dumb. That's the point is they're not actually dumb questions. They're just questions. You've assigned the value of dumb. So that's it. Okay, I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> That's a really great point, Ashley. Yeah. So I think um, we have gone a little bit over the time for our prepared questions, but I do have one last one. But before I go on with that, I would just like, like to let the audience know that if you have any questions about math and stats career in general or to any of the panelists, please feel free to leave it in the chat and we'll get to that in just one minute. So I guess the last question that I have for you guys is what advice would you give um, to people who are starting their math and stats career or having kind of doubts or not knowing what to do as a math student right now? What would advice would you give? So I think I'm gonna circle back to Susanna for a bit of advice. No worries. So I would suggest getting involved with the society. So if you're a member of MUMS, amazing, but also even professional societies outside your university, because that will help you build the connections nationwide. It will expose you to different research topics, uh, different um, seminars, different people, um, attend the conferences if you can. Um, I appreciate, you know, as an undergrad, you might not have much money available, but you know, if it's coming to your if it's someone in Melbourne or something, then try and get there if you possibly can, just to expose yourself to what is happening in this field, what is out there. And I think the other thing is don't stress too much. Like your career will happen and normally it happens much better than you would ever have expected it to. So just keep following, like keep, keep working hard, keep following um, your interests. Don't try and mold yourself into something that you expect you should be because there is a perfect... Uh, career pathway out there for you. Great, that's amazing. And we'll move on to Ifa now, if you have any advice to give. Um, uh, for, for undergraduate perspective, I think don't give up on maths too early. Definitely be open-minded about it um, and try out the second year subjects. So for me, first year was a so much better than high school. The second year, when you start to specialize, that's when uh, I truly feel really passionate about maths. So uh, for anyone um, in the audience, um, if you're in first or second year, definitely recommend you to try out any, um, yeah, keep, um, be, feel open-minded, yeah, be open-minded toward uh, about like different specializations and try at least the one second year subjects. And then if you enjoy something more, you can, you know, go deeper into it, but just be open-minded uh, at the start. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Ifan. And can we have Madeline also? Talk? Oh, you're back. Great. Um, so, yeah. So any advice to aspiring young mathematicians or anyone looking to work in the consulting industry? Yeah, um, well, I would say, first of all, coming to career events, step one ticked off for you guys. Great work. Um, but like, in all honesty, go to lots. There are lots. There are so many different industries that are completely unrelated to maths that really value logical thinking and miscellaneous analytical ability. So I do a lot of stuff that has no bearing on what I studied at university. But my workplace appreciates that they have, we have a lot of engineers and mathematicians because it means they're good logical thinkers. So your skills are very transferable. Um, and there are a lot of areas that are really interested in hiring maths grads, positions that do not say mathematician in the role. Um, I would say a really good approach with careers event is it's good to meet people and you've met us um, because these are the people who can give you advice on like which jobs might be appropriate or, um, 
even stuff like people I've met at careers events who've had been so generous with their time as to do things like read my CV and give me feedback on my CV. Um, and those are the sorts of things that help you get a job. Um, so I'd say making those connections at careers event is a really important one. Um, and I think finally, just like a very small and practical tip that I never would have known about when I was at uni, if you're coming up to the end of your degree, even as a second year, met much of the corporate world hires in February to start in like March the following year, so over 12 months later. Um, and this never would have occurred to me as an undergrad and I was lucky enough to discover it as a postgrad. Um, but if you are looking, if you are thinking about working right after your under, undergrad degree, if you want, I'd recommend doing a master's. Um, it's like at the start of your third year is a good time to look for jobs. Great. We'll move back to Marcy for a little bit more advice before we start answering the audience questions. Yeah, so all of these, all of the advice was given that was good. And I think the really important part, like like the sort of unifying thing is if you're passionate about it, you should just do it. Um, and that the rest of life will click into place. Believe it or not, life is not, like if you're happy with what you're doing, life is not as hard as it seems. Like somehow, like life is always gonna be hard, but it's not gonna be like impossible to find a way. Um, network, learn to, to know people, especially if you feel like an outsider, in, in your place, like um, there were there were lots of ways in which I, I know that I don't belong in academia. I was the first member of my family to go to university, for example. Um, I don't know how any of this works, you know, like, I, and occasionally I still feel even after 20 some years of working in academia, um, either as a grad student or as um, afterwards, I feel brutally uncomfortable in a lot of ways, but you just make a study of people, right? So find someone who you want to be and figure out what their life is like. And I don't mean like it in a creepy stalker way, maybe no stalking, but like realize that like um, you, you can, you don't have to change yourself like Susanna said, you, you don't have to be a different person. There's always somebody who shares something in common with you who managed to be successful. It's not so completely uniform as it seems at first. Um, and so I, I think like trying to find the positive, trying to find people who inspire you, trying to find things that inspire you will keep you going. Uh, as long as you're passionate, like the doors will open. Sometimes you'll have to beat them with an X, I'm not going to lie, but they'll eventually open. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, you know, also since if there are undergrads from Melbourne here who want more details on how to find said X, please just come to my office. Um, like, <laughs> I'm happy to help you with that. But like, it's, it's, uh, it's not an impossible thing. And if you're happy, if you really like what you're doing, you can find it. And also similar to what Madeline said, math is so universal. I mean, I know people who left academia along my career or my students um, who work in advertising and fashion, and blah, blah, blah. You know, like you shouldn't really think of it as, a, as an end. If you're happy at the moment when you're studying it, just study. And then you'll find some way to apply it, right? Learning how to think logically and solve problems, this will always help you in life. So um, that's an amazing advice from all of our panelists. And that's all the questions that we have prepared for this panel today. So now I'll have a look in the chat and thank you, Jen, for asking those questions. So I'll just read them out for the audience and then we can have anyone jumping from the panel to answer these questions. So the first one is, can you please give some advice on how to learn math better? I feel like my way of learning math helps me to grasp 70 to 80% of the content, but not fully. And I would really like to understand the concept fully. So any advice on learning math concepts? I think Marcy can answer this question, seeing that you are senior lecturer at the uni. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm sure Ifan also knows. Uh, so um, the way that I've learned how, how math works, so it depends. There are different types for different types of math. But like by and large, 
what I try to do when learning a new mathematical concept is to look past the problem in front of me. So say, for example, you're learning linear algebra. You learn how to, um, how to manipulate a matrix or, you know, you learn, okay, if the problem asks me to find the eigenvalues, I do step one, step two, step three. Then the question you should ask yourself is what am I actually doing? Like, and you try to connect the dots. You, you, you sort of push yourself to say, what is this pattern and have I seen it before? Have I ever seen the exact same thing happen in chemistry? And what, what I do as a mathematician, like as a pure mathematician, I literally look for patterns that occur across nature, right? Like I say, okay, I've learned how to diagonalize a matrix. Where have I seen this before? What does this mean to me? And like, so when you push past the idea of formulas or, and you stop worrying about getting the answer, but worry, like trying to tell yourself, if I ever saw a problem that asked me X, I would do Y. Then you're going to, it's all going to click. Now it's harder to do in practice than it sounds. You just have to do an insane amount of problems, to be honest. Um, and it's a lot of work. Um, and this will depend on the subject. So if you're doing more applied things, you're gonna want to, to sort of also think about where the problem is coming from. So if you're doing like mathematical physics, the more physics you learn, the better you'll do at math physics. Um, I certainly didn't learn differential equations particularly well until I learned enough physics. Because otherwise it seemed like memorizing tricks and then using those tricks to solve problems. But that's not at all what the subject is about. Um, and I'm sure Susanna can say the same about statistics. It's sort of like, if you know where the data comes from, you know how to analyze it better. It's, it's, I don't know if that's correct at all. Like somehow like you have to, you have to put things in context. And so the, the key to learning to do math better is to look past the problem directly in front of you and think about what you as a sort of human computer, because that's what your brain is. How would you fix this problem? Like, what is the problem asking you? And as soon as you can do that, you're gonna be okay. okay. I, I would actually like to hear a statistician's point of view on this. So I would like to hear what Susanna thinks about what I just said. Could they even unmute? Um, that was great advice, Marcy. So I really didn't have much to add. I think from a statistical perspective, like you're right about the data, like often there's nuances in how it's collected as well, which can, lead to certain biases. And if you don't actually have a good understanding of what they might be, you can actually end up with an incorrect answer at the end. So yes, that very comprehensive approach is super important. One thing I'd like to add to that, and because everybody's learning styles are different and everybody has like different ways of like getting maths and information into their brains. What always worked really well for me uh, was maths through argument or just general you know, discussion. I learned best by finding classmates who were interested in talking to me about maths and debating things with them of being like, you know, let's work on a problem together. And I'll be like, I think we should do this. And they'll be like, no way, we should try this. And it's through that debate and disagreement. Um, and I really love doing that in shoots as well of like having a group and like, you know, or, or trying to suggest maybe we don't know what to do, let's try this. And then someone will be like, no, that's not gonna work. And you'll be like, well, why? Um, and it's through that discussion and working with other people that I found worked well for me for under, like having that deep understanding of the topic. Cause I just get bored if I'm sitting there and doing it by myself. Um, and to add on to that, um, as a student, I think practically what I found to be helping me every single day is keep writing. Um, I feel like I don't understand a thing I learned in lecture until I have written in my own words, in my own summary notes. Um, so definitely recommend, you know, yeah, reading through the lecture slide is great, but also write something at the same time in your own words um, so to make sure you're fully digesting the content. Um, as Madeline said, um, everyone's different for me. I really like visualizing things. Um, so even if it's really abstract, pure mathematics, um, I like to draw cartoons that doesn't make sense to anyone but me. Um, so for example, maybe in group theory, we're learning about orbits and um, 
stabilizer and I drew this weird circle with circle inside and partitions um, that doesn't really make sense mathematically it's not rigorous but just something to help me imagine what's going on visually um, so I found that helpful uh, another comment is uh, you mentioned like understand the concept fully um, I, I realized recently that it's not really like a black and white thing. It's more like an asymptote that you're forever reaching that 100% line, but you never quite reach it. Um, so what made me realize this was a professor of mine um, just the other day, and he suddenly asked us, oh, what's holomorphic? Um, because they were talking about complex analysis. It seems like a simple definition that everyone everyone um, in the analysis, they will know, but he still asks that question um, and then trying to make sense of what it really means. So even a professor, he would like, he, uh, he thinks he doesn't understand it completely and is always trying to understand it even more. Um, so I feel like, yeah, don't be, if you're disencouraged, if you feel like you're not understanding something fully, um, instead just always understand a bit more, uh, a bit like, 0.01% more is better than before. Um, yeah, um, that would be my comment for that. Yeah, those are all very great advice. I'll definitely implement some of those suggestions in my own learning, especially the little diagrams. I love that idea from Yifan. Um, and then we have another question from Jen as well. Is there any way to overcome imposter syndrome? I sometimes feel overwhelmed by all the talented people around me. I constantly doubt myself if I am on the right track of doing more math in my computer science degree. Thanks a lot. And that's definitely a comment that I can sort of relate to having some, some sort of self doubts and wondering if I'm good enough to do, be doing what I'm doing. So any advice on that panelists will be very, very welcome. <laughs> Um, I was fortunate to do a Superstars of STEM program a couple of years ago, it's kind of a two-year program. First, you get lots of training. One of the training things is about overcoming imposter syndrome because it is rife in most high-performing people, but possibly even more in high-performing women. So um, one of the exercises we actually did, and like these are people we just met a couple of hours earlier, and we had to go around the room and introduce ourselves, not with our name, but with like our deepest kind of um, belief about ourselves and and the impostery kind of belief so for me it was like I'm not good enough I said hello I'm not good enough and uh, the person said hello I'm I, like I found a kindred spirit it's like you know they, they had a really similar one I was like oh, we are the same but it was like every single person in that room who were amazing amazing women that I was kind of honored to be in the same room as um, they all had these beliefs about the fact they didn't really belong there they they weren't up to it and I think just recognizing it for the lie that it is. Like it's almost, you know, they say, um, if you're a psychopath, you never consider the fact you might be a psychopath. So if you have imposter syndrome, it's actually probably a really good sign that you're actually performing incredibly well. That is very, very kind of good insight into the mindset of having imposter syndrome is that you realize that you do have imposter syndrome sometimes when I, for example, for me, if I have self-doubts, I'm thinking, hmm, I'm only having these doubts because of imposter syndrome. But I think in reality, it is pretty hard to overcome. But I think just starting with recognizing that is a very, very, very good kind of point. Um, anyone else have advice for Jim? Um, I would just say that in general, everyone has it. And what, what was a really exciting experience for me, and by exciting, I mean terrifying experience for me is, so I used to work at UCLA um, with Terry Tao. And I would do this stupid thing where I would be like super insecure about like my research by comparison to, if you don't know who Terry Tao is, he's a fields medalist, he's Australian. So that's um, an interesting side point, um, but a fields medalist at um, UCLA. And I made the mistake of like trying to explain like my research to him in like the quickest, fastest, fanciest way. You know, and he's like, you know, I don't know what any of those words mean, right? And then you would, um, you would go about like sort of, okay, what's the next level, you know, like, trying that I don't want to embarrass myself in front of this mathematician who's like you know clearly recognized as a genius and then you realized that 
what I realized at the, with the great fortune of working in a place with, with all, I mean, he wasn't the only brilliant mathematician there, it was just that everyone knows what they work on and that's what they know. And um, they're good at it and maybe they're better at it than you, but like they don't know everything and they get as insecure as you do about those like exact moments. And once that was clear to me that I had to like tone even my, my own work down for people who are much better mathematicians than me and I'm not insecure about that statement, um, like in order to have a conversation that um, I, I think that really helps. Like, so basically math makes all of us feel like we're imposters. And that's both the best thing about it and like the worst. So it's never going away, but you're definitely not alone. Um, and it is true for women, we have a way harder time of getting over it. Um, you just, you walk into a room and you're just, I don't know what it is, but I, I have probably also would have introduced myself as, hi, I'm not good enough. <laughs> hi, I don't know what I'm doing here would probably be like the, my introduction. And um, that's how we, we feel. And it doesn't, it doesn't go away, but you can also think of it as a good thing. Like, because that's just what math does to all of us. And like, I actually consider that a nice challenge for life. Um, that's, um, I don't know, that's, that's the best I can do with it. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, Randy. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with what both of you have said. I think that's like a really important thing to understand is it's something basically everyone feels. And something that's been helpful for me is um, working on my innate perfectionism or feeling like I'm not, you know, good enough at something because I haven't done literally the best job ever that it was possible to do on something. Um, so when you said like, um, Jen, I think you said uh, like you're 70 to 80 percent of the way there. I looked at that and I was like, 70 to 80 percent. That's great. That's like way more than 50 percent. Um, and I think like changing, working on that attitude, I find like, you know, I always want to feel like I've done the best job ever at something or like, you know, I'm doing better than everyone else around me. And that's just not how the world works. It's like, you're always doing just a fine job. And there are a lot of other people who are doing better jobs than you. Um, and a lot of other people doing worse. And I think, um, in context outside of maths, it's really nice to notice like, well, you don't, you don't have to every day at work be doing the best work you've ever done. You can just do some fine work and just move slightly in the right direction. And eventually that adds up over a while to some really good work. So I think um, another thing that like gets thrown around a lot at work is like perfect is the enemy of done. Like when we're doing a piece of analysis and like throwing it around at each other and being like, this isn't quite right. This isn't quite right. At some point you've just got to be like, well, it exists and it's good enough and it'll do. Um, so I think contextualizing what you're doing, being like some days it's not about doing the, like a great job, just like being there and giving it a go is more than enough. And there are just so many things in life that are about showing up rather than being the best at something. Yeah, I totally agree with Madeline. Um, the fact that you're there and you're actively participating. Um, yeah, that's great. And yeah, I feel um, imposter syndrome, is syndrome all the time as well. So sometimes in a tutorial, if you're slightly behind on the course, uh, you might, everyone's solving a problem um, you might feel like oh I can't contribute ideas um, how come everyone knows what's going on not me during those moments um, I like to ask questions so that kind of brings um, yeah we kind of discussed this slightly earlier by asking a question even if it's a silly or a simple question I'm kind of like putting it out there that oh I don't know this and by kind of admitting that oh I still have so much to learn it kind of relieve myself so that I don't have to pretend that I know things I just made that I don't know things but by actively asking questions people will often help you and then so you'll feel better because you now they'll answer your question and now you will learn more um yeah so I found when you're feeling like you're losing track of things and starting to feel like an imposter just ask a question and people will help you um yeah so we had a very, very good discussion all around it again. And now we're going to move on to a question from Grace. Um, she said, a question for Marcy, what qualities have you found useful by studying successful mathematicians? Others feel free to discuss as well. 
Um, so yeah, by, by paying attention to people around me, I guess I found that um, the most successful mathematicians I know, they don't limit themselves by saying, I study X. They want to know everything. Um, almost all really like high achieving um, mathematicians and also scientists that I've had the privilege of meeting in my career, they just like to be confused. They're very comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, like to quote my trainer, who's always saying that, which I disagree with in the personal training aspect of life, by the way. But, um, but like, you know, like you, you just get comfortable being uncomfortable. And um, they're very good at, at sort of just asking questions, expecting that other people will help them and not being afraid of what's going to happen if they said something dumb. And I mean, this is like, I've, I've seen this um, with, with a lot of, of very um, prominent mathematicians. In fact, you can be in like a seminar with, with some of the best in the world and they tend to ask the dumb question you already know the answer to. And it's a really like enlightening experience once you start when like, because I, I didn't notice this early in my career because I was so paranoid about my own stupidity. I was so like obsessed with myself, but like once, um, actually really once my friend like ex explained to me about this thing with questions and I started paying attention to the rest of the room and like letting my own insecurity breathe for a second, you know, um, that the best people in the room ask the dumbest questions. And once you realize this, like it's just, everyone just wants to learn. And if you can let go of the fear, the perfectionism, the worry about being wrong or asking something inappropriate, like then you can actually really expand as a thinker. And it's so hard. I, I can't, I, there's no way I can make it sound good. Like, I mean, I, need therapy and some exercise. I'm a boxer. I highly recommend that as like part of your mathematical training, <laughs> some way to like relieve stress. You know, it's, it's not like an easy thing to do to like go against everything that is natural in your body. But like, if you can like let go of that fear, um, that seems to be the key. As far as I can tell from observation, that's the key. Just let the fear go and um, you're going to be fine. Yeah, thank you, Marcy, for that really insightful answer. And I guess I can expand that question to a very kind of maybe a little bit more general one, which is what, how, what, who are your kind of inspirations in mathematics and what do you learn from them? So I might just, I think Ifan is ready to answer that question. <laughs> I, Anyone can jump in, yeah. But yeah, there's so many people who I look up to. Lots of them are in our school. Um, okay, um, and the kind of each one of them has a certain aspect I really look up to. Um, so some examples. So for example, um, Christine. Um, um, like um, yeah, she taught me vector calculus. Um, what I love her is whenever she talks, she's very assertive. She's never afraid that uh, uh, maybe this is this could be a good suggestion. She wouldn't, um, yeah, she, um, she wouldn't, uh, in her tone, um, she wouldn't put herself down. So whenever she wants to say something, she would, um, yeah, while being very, um, you know, considerate and respectful. So uh, I look up to Christine. Hopefully one day I can be, you know, as um, eloquent as her. Um, Marcy, sorry to <laughs> put you on the spot, um, but Marcy is another person who I look up to. Because when she talks, she's she's a brilliant mathematician, but at the same time, she's so friendly. And then you just feel like, oh, she could be, you know, your aunt or someone that like, so easy to talk to. Um, so I love how humble she is even though she's brilliant and doing all these amazing things um i also love how versatile marcy is so not only research but she's involved with committee and then um like 
editorial things, like so many things going on. Um, yeah, and then um, Ting Ting Xue, who is my lecturer for algebra, I love how focused she is with with her research. Like, oh, if she's interested in this area, um, she doesn't worry about oh, what would the grants, people who approve grants, what would they like? Of course, she has to consider that for you know grant purposes. Um, but she cares more about the mathematics she does um, and what she's really interested in and just follow that. So I would say, um, yeah, I have so many role models and they all have so many inspiring qualities. Um, yeah, um, and yeah, so I kind of borrow a bit from everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I might, I kind of want to ask Susanna. Yes, she should me to herself. Um, yeah, the same question. Same question. Um, so I think for me, a key one would actually be he was my principal supervisor of my PhD. It was um, Professor Kerry Mangerson at QUT. Uh, brilliant statistician, worldwide renowned, um, but absolutely lovely person, incredibly willing to help people out. Um, to bend over backwards, to do things that you think no professor should be considering doing. Um, but yeah, just really, really impressive. And I think just touching briefly on that imposter syndrome and how people learn and other things we discussed previously as well. Like I know early in my PhD, because I just felt like I'd find a paper, I'd read the paper, I would not understand this paper. Um, and I was like, oh, will I ever get there? And uh, she was saying how, you know, she would still find a paper, <laughs> read a paper, she might understand it all, but she'll put it aside and six months later, she'll come back to probably understand more at that time. So it is just that constant journey. Um, the other thing, which I feel I'm getting totally off tangent on this question now, so I apologize. Um, but I did a training thing this morning just with QT and they were talking, um, they had this saying, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. Because I think we always want to be seen as so smart, but uh, then we don't have the chance to learn. So it is really that humility, being willing to just ask these questions. So sorry for going so off topic. <laughs> Thanks. No, I think that was a very, very good point. And Grace did say that, oh, I agree. Oh, sorry, that was for a previous discussion that we had, I guess. But it was great to see discussions in the chat as well. Um, I think finally we'll hear from Madeline on the same topic, your role models and why they inspire you. Um, yeah, I think one of the, I have a mathematical role model and a work role model. My mathematical role model is a um, historical one, but Katherine Johnson, I'm sure you guys have seen Hidden Figures um, or read the book. And that was something that I, you know, ne had never heard about, I think, until the film came out. And I was like, oh, my God, what cool history. It kind of feels like women have been invisible in or like you know, there aren't that many stories of women involved in the history of maths, whether or not they were involved and their contributions just weren't noticed at the time. But that was so cool to see, like, you know, the one um, sort of feature film about women being the genius in the room and doing the really important mathematical thing. So I love that. Um, and one of my inspirations at work is the person who I actually met at the careers event who ended up encouraging me to apply for the job. Um, but someone at work who is um, sort of like quite senior in our, in our company, a director, which is the level before a partner, which is the most senior. Um, but someone, what I really admire about her is someone who's, she's a trained engineer, very analytical um, and sort of logical thinker and really respected for like being a very technically competent person at work. Um, but also somebody who really values things that I think are important, like not working too hard or having a good work-life balance. Um, so one of the things that's really exciting to see is she works part-time four days a week just because she thinks five days is too much time to spend working, um, which is a shift that I love to see, like people in, the, in, um, in places like consulting, a lot of people work really, really hard and think you need to work super long hours to be good at this job. Um, and a phrase to borrow from my friend Annalise, who you might have seen if you're at the earlier careers event, but she likes to say that she works, she works hard, but she doesn't work long. Um, so I think I find that inspiring is like you can be very good at something by working hard at it, but that doesn't mean you need to spend all your waking hours on it and you can have other things that are important to you in your life as well. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for answering all of the audience questions and our questions. Um, 
Is there any other audience members who have questions for our panelists? Um, if not, I'm going to stop the recording. And before that, thank you everyone for attending our um, event today. And thank you especially to the panelists who have had amazing discussions and to contribute amazing advice for everyone. Um, yeah, I'll stop the recording now. <laughs>